my name is Indy Chol. I'm head of international relations at the MLC. And my role really is to engage with international rights holders to explain what, what is the MLC's role in the mechanical licensing sphere, but also to explain why they need to be engaged. And so it's important that songwriters understand uh, what's happening in the US, um, whether they need to become a member or not, and how they can work with their local CMOs um, in the various different territories. So nice to be here. And thanks again, Andrew, for inviting us. Um, hi, everyone. It's really nice to be here. Um, my name is Rebecca Webster. I'm the Director of Industry Relations and Communications at CMRRA. That's Canadian Musical Reproduction Rights Agency. Our headquarters are in Toronto. And um, I'll be t giving you a bit of the groundworks about CMRA just after this with a little presentation. Um, but I'm really happy to be here because we are partnered with the MLC. Um, I just wanted to mention just off the top, because we've mentioned a lot of acronyms, if there's anything that you don't understand as we're talking, please shout it out in the chat and we'll try and clarify. Um, but uh, the MLC stands for Mechanical Licensing Collective. And we've also mentioned CMO, which is the uh, collective management organization. So um, please make this um, you know, a useful learning experience for you as well. It's great to be here. Thanks, Rebecca. I appreciate that. We are all about acronyms in this business sometimes. Day, tell us about what you do. Sure. Um, thank you for having me. My name is Day Bogan. I'm the head of third party partnerships at uh, the MLC. Uh, primarily, my role is to work with external organizations and companies and individuals um, to create strategic partnerships to reach and engage um, songwriters as well as publishers. Um, as well as um, companies that empower and support songwriters and publishers like music rights technology companies, for example. Um, so it's pretty broad, uh, but the idea is that we're going to um, use these, leverage these relationships to reach and educate um, the community about uh, MLC and to get them onboarded. Yeah, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna share a little presentation and then you know, if there are questions after, please feel free to write some in the chat and uh, then we'll move on to what our relationship is with the MLC. So um, let me just move things around here. This is me, who I am, just, there you go. Um, so I'm the Director of Industry Relations and Communications at CMRA. Um, it's a very, very long acronym, the Canadian Musical Reproduction Rights Agency. We were established in 1975 and we're headquartered in Toronto. Um, CMRA represents music copyright owners who are doing business in Canada. Um, and as the market leading musical reproduction rights agency, we know that data is the key to flowing money back to our clients. And we focus on detailed share by share matching of musical works. Um, we have a match rate of approximately 90%. Now, when I say musical works, I mean songs. Um, that's just the legal term that has come up a lot. Um, but, uh, you know, these days you can kind of use those terms a little bit interchangeably. Um, just to establish who we work with, we work with um, all three of the major music publishers. That's uh, Sony Music Publishing, Universal Music Canada, and Warner Chapel. We also work with most independent music publishers and uh, self-published songwriters. And we also work with managers. I know there are a lot of you out there who are watching us today who are managers um, and publishing administrators as well. And so those are people who empower um, you know, self-published songwriters and help them administer their catalogs. Now in our system, if you're a songwriter who carries out the business of music publishing on your own, we consider you a self-published songwriter. So you actually wear two hats, songwriter hat and the publishing hat. And if you're a manager who represents a songwriter who carries out the business of music publishing on their own, CMRI simply needs directions from the songwriter for you to become part of the administration team of their catalog. And we do this all the time and it's really easy. So um, we're very happy to be working with managers um, day in and day out. Um, one of the things that really sets us apart in Canada is that we can retroactively collect royalties from the online music services. And in Canada, as you can see from this graph, um, we launched those or those services launched in 2004. Um, so if you were to join CMRA today, we can actually retroactively collect from those online music services um, and also do the future collection, the go forward collection as well. 
So what we're all here to talk about today is that um, we're working with new global partners um, to provide music publishers and self-published songwriters an option to facilitate international licensing and royalty collection. And the reason that CMRA and the MLC are here today together is because really we're very um, focused on making sure that the money is collected. And that is our prime goal. We don't mind what you choose, whether you choose to work with CMRA or with the MLC directly, um, but we want you to know about the options you have. Um, and we wanna make sure that you're actually collecting from the MLC. Um, I mentioned our two partners because this launch of our, um, our international collections actually happened just recently in March and we have two partners. So Impel is our partner outside of North America. Um, so specifically we're collecting digital mechanical royalties with the MLC and with Impel. The MLC and Impel will collect from music only services while Impel will additionally collect from audio visual services such as Facebook and YouTube. Uh, Indy and Day are gonna talk about this, but the MLC was recently created. It was mandated by the US Congress by the Music Modernization Act, and it launched on January 1st, 2021. Um, digital service providers will be paying mechanical royalties to the MLC, both for prior periods and on a going forward basis. And this is really addressing our relationship. Um, we're a collective management organization member of the MLC. And so we're effectively going to be ensuring that musical works or songs are properly registered so that past and future US digital mechanical royalties are flowing efficiently and in line with the same service levels we're already providing for Canadian royalties. Now we're doing the same thing outside of North America with our partner Impel. I just wanna, I kept it in the presentation because I did wanna make sure that you knew that there were options for collection outside of North America as well. Um, I won't stay on this long, but we are working with them on the collection of digital royalties for territories outside of them on a go forward basis only. And we're really pleased with the relationship with Impel because um, you know, they really align seamlessly with their own mandate for accurate and detailed collection and distribution of rights holders royalties. So we're doing it in phases with Impel. Um, phase one is to collect with their core territories and then we'll be expanding to more of their licensed territories in the future. And uh, just to give you a picture of how many territories those are, this is it. There's about 76 countries in that list. Um, and, uh, you know, those are listed on our website as well. So the way it works is upon receipt of distributions from the MLC and from Impel, um, payments will be included in the regular flow of our quarterly cycles. So we distribute four times a year, March, June, September, and December. It's regular, it's transparent, and, um, it's reliable. And, uh, that's how we're going to be, um, dealing with getting the money out. So really we've launched these services so that you can streamline your workflow and centralize your digital royalty collections. And we really want you to let us register the data properly and efficiently. We know that sometimes it's a bit too much for you to do it on your own, either on behalf of your songwriters that you represent um, or as your own um, manager or artist entrepreneur self, sometimes it's really hard to do it all. Um, I wanted to mention too that in 2019, CMRA launched the Unclaimed Works Portal, and it allows music publishers and self-published songwriters to search the active repertoire of online music services in Canada and match recordings to songs. So this is really the ultimate in transparency. Um, clients and non-clients alike can actually access this portal. There's a verification process, but um, it's, uh, it's something to check out. And I know that Taylor will be posting in a link in our chat here just for you to um, take a look at it. We created this service to empower rights holders, particularly smaller publishers, self-published songwriters, the managers who represent them um, by giving unprecedented access to information to aid in identifying and claim royalties. Now, the only reason I'm mentioning this is because the MLC's conversation today is, is about um, you know, getting more money back to rights holders. And um, this is another uh, tool that we have on, on the CMRA side for Canada that does the same thing. Uh, 
I don't know if I did that too quickly, but I just wanted to. Uh, oh, that was uh, great. Thank you. <laughs> um, that's where we end today. Um, but I'm sure there's going to be a lot of questions on the chat and I'll pass it over to Andrea. Sure. Um, yeah, I mean, there was a couple of advanced questions that I think, you know, before we before we jump into the MLC uh, side, it would be, I think it would be good just to drill into some of these questions. Can you just clarify, so the CMRA, do you, you do physical and digital collections, is that right? So that's a difference as well. We do, um, you know, sometimes it's usually the first point of contact for people when they're trying to, you know, press uh, records or uh, manufacture CDs or even USB keys, um, they come to us to get a license for um, the use of other people's songs. So covers usually um, included on those physical products. Um, and, but that's the physical side. It's a department called Pay As You Press. What we're talking about today is really about the collection of um, digital mechanical royalties, which is another one of our lines of business that we collect for. Great, thank you. Um, okay, well, let's move on then, I guess, to we'll move on to the, the MLC side and start connecting those dots. Thanks, Rebecca, and we'll do more questions after. Right, hmm. thank you. I'll just start sharing my screen, so just bear with me one moment. Great, okay, fantastic. Okay, so um, I just wanted to um, start basically by giving an overview of the MLC. And then we'll talk about some key features of the MLC and Dave's going to join in halfway through. Okay, so where did the MLC start? So basically the MLC was created pursuant to the Music Modernization Act of 2018. So that's a key act um, that brought about the MLC. Now what this act actually did was to address amongst other things, the failure of the digital audio services to effectively license and pay mechanical royalties on musical works. So what US Congress did, it created almost a CMO basically with the goal of making it easier for songwriters to receive the mechanical royalties owed for use of their songs by interactive streaming services and download services from the likes of Amazon, Spotify, Amazon Music and so on. So why it came about, well, before the Music Modernization Act, um, the digital services were effectively operating under a song by song licensing system and what they had to do really was to contact all the copyright owners and or send notices of intent to them to get licenses for mechanical licenses for musical works. Now that would be fine if they knew who the copyright owners were of those musical works. The issue was there was no access to say a global database where they could research that information and often they had the sound recording information from the labels, but not necessarily the musical works information. And also that whole process was quite inefficient. If you think about how many songs are on a platform, that's a lot of licenses they needed to get. And also you have to think about nowadays, um, the amount of songwriters that could be on a work as well. It's not just generally, you know, the one or two songwriters probably that we're all used to um, from a while back. So there was a lot of licenses um, that they needed to um, acquire. And this obviously meant a lot of inefficiency in the whole process. And what we found was that there was um, a lot of unmatched data. So there were sat on data that they weren't able to match. So a lot of usage data. Um, they were then held on to those monies because they didn't know who to pay. So which songwriters to pay. And also it meant that often they faced lawsuits because they didn't actually have the appropriate licenses in place. So there was a lot of pressure to actually sort out this inefficiency in this mess. So supported by a coalition of songwriters, publishers and trade associations, the Music Modernization Act actually created the MLC or the, a CMO that would effectively create um, a sort of offer a blanket license to the digital services for mechanical rights. So from the MMA, so under the Music Modernization Act, songwriters' mechanical rights are subject to a compulsory blanket license. And this means that digital music services can now pay mechanical royalties for the interactive streaming and downloads without having to secure individual licenses. So to contact all the copyright owners, provided they comply with statutory and regulatory uh, requirements. And that includes paying the royalties and submitting usage reports 
to the MLC for the blanket. So basically the MLC was created to address inefficiency and to ensure that rights holders would get paid for their usages accurately and on time. And also the Music Modernization Act, it actually stated that the digital services would, should fund the MLC and also that the MLC should create a public database. So that's one of the key purposes of the MLC. It is to administer that blanket license to the digital services that covers the use of every song they make available on their streaming and download platforms. <clears throat> so the digital services have to submit now a notice of license as of January the 1st this year, a notice of license to the MLC, and they also must send their usage reports to the MLC. The MLC will then match the sound recordings to the musical works in its database, process the royalties owed, and then the MLC will pay its members for the blanket license royalties. <clears throat> and it's important to note that the MLC is the exclusive administrator of the new blanket license in the US. So no other organization in the US can administer this blanket license. And thus it's the only organization that can collect and distribute those royalties pursuant to the blanket. Now importantly, from an international perspective, the blanket license will cover any musical work, regardless of where the copyright owner is based, if that usage took place in the US. So that's why we've been engaging internationally with CMOs, with publishers, with songwriters, to make sure that they understand that actually the MLC is relevant to them. So what does this blanket license actually cover? So it actually covers digital audio mechanical rights only. So in the US, that would include interactive streams, limited downloads, permanent downloads, but it doesn't include video streams or downloads. So the audio visual usage. So for example, a YouTube video, that would not be included. It doesn't include public performance. It doesn't include mechanicals, uh, which I know CMRA obviously do license or interactive streams for satellite or internet radio. So in terms of where the MLC actually sits in, in the US landscape, it's almost like it sits alongside existing organizations. So in the US, the digital services actually allow consumers to engage with music in different ways. So these different ways involve different rights and different flows of royalties uh, from um, the digital services to the creators. And these flows are different for musical works and they're different for recordings. So the MLC is actually part of that royalty flow that's generated by the reproduction and the distribution of musical works. And the PROs on the left, so your ASCAPs, BMI, CZAC, they're part of the flow that's generated by the public performance of musical works. So on the, on the right side, the sound recording side, you have record distributors and aggregators, and they're part of the flow that are also generated by the reproduction and distribution of the sound recordings. And then you have on the right as well, sound exchange, which is part of the flow generated by the digital public performance of the sound recordings. So you can see here that the MLC fits on the um, reproduction distribution side. We also um, have to note that the blanket license isn't mandatory. So there are options for digital services to acquire voluntary licenses directly with the uh, rights holders. So that information on the right hand side is just referring to those voluntary licenses. They still have to submit the usage data to us though. So that's something to note. So in terms of who needs to become a member, well, it's basically anybody who's entitled to collect digital audio mechanical royalties from licensees in the US. So that could cover a music publisher, you could be an administrator, you could be a CMO, or you could actually be a self-administered songwriter. So as mentioned earlier, songwriters can also join the MLC as well as publishers, administrators and CMOs. So the MLC will pay anyone entitled to collect those mechanicals for a given musical work. So the process of membership is quite straightforward. It's uh, basically going to straight to the website. You can connect to collect um, and the membership is free An important note there. So we don't charge uh, any admin fee, um, uh, sorry, any membership fee. You can enroll there, connect to collect. Um, you go there and you can actually then start creating a user account and also your member profile. Now, importantly at the bottom here, you can actually see that it is mentioned that digital services, because they pay the MLC's operating costs, 
we don't deduct any commission. So we actually distribute 100% of the royalties we collect. So as members, as songwriters, publishers and CMOs, we, they all have a part to play in the MLC. Now, one of the key parts is obviously registering your data. And it's really important that um, you make sure that you can check your data. We're going to talk a little bit more. Dave's going to talk a little bit more about the Data Quality Initiative, because it's really important that you check your data. You can even do that even if you're a member or if you're not a member. So that's really important to note. But in terms of registering your data, if you're a member, you can do that directly into the MLC portal one at a time. Um, you can also have an option to register via Excel bulk upload. Um, if you have, you wanted to do um, say a couple of hundred works, for example, or the preferred method is obviously CWR, which is um, more of a sort of EDI format for larger data files. There are options available there, as you can see. And for those who already have an existing account with Harry Fox, then there is an option there for you to register directly with them, continue to register directly with them, without the need to register with the MLC. And the reason why we have that arrangement is that the Harry Fox is one of the vendors of the MLC and they're obliged to share their data with us. So that's one of, one of the key parts in, in terms of playing, playing your part at the MLC. So now we're gonna talk a little bit more about the Data Quality Initiative and I'm just gonna pass over to Day here now. Thank you very much, Indy. Um, just some quick background. The MLC again was, um, uh, founded in 2020 and went into operations in uh, 2021. But um, as Indy mentioned, HFA is our uh, vendor. Um, as part of that relationship, we acquired HFA's uh, database of song ownership, and we have been working to um, clean up and update that data um, over the last year. And part of that um, initiative is our data quality initiative, which uh, the purpose of this um, initiative is to compare your uh, data with the data that we have, which we've acquired um, previously. So if you register works in the past um, or an eight, uh, publisher or administrator have registered works on your behalf, um, as long as that work uh, is, is accurate, then uh, we should be able to um, use that work to match um, current uh, streams. But um, in the event there are inaccuracies um, or discrepancies uh, between that data um, and, and your data, um, then the data quality initiative is a process for checking um, um, that and reporting back any discrepancies in bulk. Go to the next page. Uh, so, so far, the data quality initiative, we've had over 550 participants. We've compared over 22 million works. Um, again, the comparison process is that um, uh, we have a way to um, check your entire catalog of data in bulk against our data um, to highlight any discrepancies and to, to send a report back to you um, to let you know, you know where there may be discrepancies that need to be fixed. Um, those discrepancies may be holding up royalties. Um, so it's important um, to participate in data quality initiative, especially if you are a publisher um, um, or a CMO. We've had a number of webinars in regards to the DQI on our website, which you can find at mlc.com forward slash resources. Um, and we've got all the way of checking your data, whether you are a member of the MLC or not, is to use our public search. Uh, we are mandated to uh, create and maintain a public search, which launched um, in December of last year. Um, and you can search our database, um, the song title with um, your work code, ISRS, uh, our ISWC code, uh, your writer name, um, and a number of other um, search uh, fields. Um, so this is really important for songwriters, whether or not you're represented by a publisher, is to check to see um, if we have your works um, or if we do have your works, but a portion of those works are not, uh, uh, a portion of the um, collection shares are not uh, registered, uh, which would tell you that um, you know, someone may be missing um, their uh, portion of the work in our database. So when do we pay out royalties? Um, the MLC pays out royalties on a monthly basis. Um, we have a 75 day uh, uh, gap between when those royalties were earned and when those royalties are paid out. Uh, so for example, the royalties that were earned in January were paid out in April. Um, royalties that were earned in February are paid out in May and royalties that were earned in March will be paid out this month of June. Uh, so we do have a 75 day processing window um, but um, it is a monthly basis. So if you are earning royalties on a monthly basis um, in digital streaming services, 
um, those royalties um, are paid out um, 75 uh, days later um, to the member that is representing that particular work share. Um, so if you're, for example, working uh, a member of CMRRA, um, then um, you know, those royalties are paid out uh, to the organization. Um, and then the organization accounts to you as a member um, for, those, for those months as well. Um, one of the big ch uh, changes that the MMA um, uh, created was a single uh, sort of source of uh, dealing with the historical unmatched royalties. Historical unmatched royalties are royalties um, that were earned against the uh, streaming of musical works that were not properly matched um, from digital services um, over many years. Uh, so for example, um, when a song was not registered um, or a DSP could not identify the copyright owner in a musical work, um, the mechanical royalties accrued but were not paid out and, and they set sort of an escrow account. Um, so those funds were transferred to the ML uh, MLC um, and we're now um, gearing up to uh, make that uh, searchable um, so that um, uh, rights holders can search the unmatched um, and, you know, and find um, potentially, you know, unclaimed or, or, or undistributed royalties. Uh, we're also uh, matching the, on a the regular basis ourselves with the data that we get from work, new work registrations um, and data cleanup processes such as the DQI. Um, so by registering works, um, you're able to potentially unlock the historical unmatched royalties in addition to making sure that you're getting paid your current uh, uh, royalties that are due. Okay. That's all we have uh, today. So um, there is more information. You can visit www.themlc.com. And also we do have a good support team as well with any questions. So great. Thank you, Dave. I will end my presentation. Great. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, I mean, the, this is, it's, I have a couple of questions myself. So um, uh, I know, Rebecca, if you want to jump in, with what you had noted in the chat. So just with regards to, um, you know, how people should be signing up to, or how what the options are to sign up with the MLC. So if you can just reiterate that, that would be great. Yeah, I, I just, I wrote it in the chat, but I did want to mention that, um, yes, you can sign up directly with the MLC. It's free, there's no cost. Um, it's it's wonderful that it's, it's, it's set up like this, but you can also sign up if you're a client of CMRA, you can sign up with us as well. You have to opt in. It's an opt in um, for the MLC specifically. Um, and what we would do at that point is we would verify your works and make sure that you own that for the US as well. And at that point, we do the work on your behalf and make sure that we are registering your works. And then, as Day mentioned, when the, um, you know, they're, they're paying out monthly. And then that in turn gets paid out to our clients quarterly. Um, and there is a fee, there is an administration fee on the CMRA side, it's 5%. Um, some people might be like, why would I pay when it's free? Well, it's a lot of work. Um, so, you know, if, if you're just overwhelmed with your creative career and you're, you're just focused on other things that we, we literally set this up as a service so that you would have some options. Um, and because we know we, we do register works well and easily and we are experts in this. So um, just, um, I'm just looking at the chat now to see if there's any follow-ups. Um, I think there is a bit, you know, maybe it would be helpful um, if you don't mind, Rebecca, I know that you, you know how to talk about all of this, but uh, if just a little bit of an overview, there's Katie's asked a question, yeah. you know, asking about which to register for it. Da, 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 da. So it might just be helpful if we can all just get on the same page. And <laughs> Canadian perspective. Yeah. Um, uh, we, we work uh, on the reproduction right. So we work with uh, people who own the music copyrights um, for song compositions. And anytime that song is used in some way or reproduced, that's why they call it a reproduction right. And it's much easier to think about when you're thinking about it from a physical sense. Um, you know, it was initially an actual song composition that was transferred onto a piano roll and that that's the physical reproduction. And they knew that there had to be some compensation for that. Now we're in a, di a digital world. So we're talking about the reproduction when it comes to being used on a 
radio station or on an online streaming platform, that kind of thing. Um, so we, we work with owners, so songwriters, so self-published songwriters and music publishers, music publishers being um, you know, companies who work with rosters of songwriters. Um, there's a question here about Connect Music Licensing in Canada. They're the ones who um, deal with the reproduction of the actual recording. So the recording can have many, many recordings, right? There can be many versions of these recordings, but there's only ever one song composition. So, um, you know, if you actually own the recording as well, and sometimes you don't because sometimes you're working with a record label, then, um, you know, if you're working with a record label, then you don't go to connect. Um, but if you do own that, then it's connect or it's Socrate if you're in Quebec. Um, and then there's also, you know, most people in Canada do know about SOCAN. There are performing rights organization. I know Day and Indy mentioned ASCAP, BMI, CSAC. Those are all examples of PROs. Um, and then there's also the quadrant of uh, Sound Exchange uh, and SAG AFTRA, or if you could just uh, sign up with one of the partner organizations of um, Resound. So that's MROC. Actor Racks or Artisti. This sounds crazy, but I have a graphic that Taylor has put in the chat and it will visualize it for you. And then you don't have to hyperventilate when you're thinking about it. But yes, um, everyone go look at that graphic. <laughs> go look at the graphic. <laughs> it's really helpful. Yeah. Um, but I've listed all of your sort of choices. Um, you know, yeah, there you go. Taylor's posted it. Yeah, and I, I just wanted to add, Rebecca, as well, just to confirm that the MLC will only collect for, in the US. So it's for US yes. exploitation only. So that's yeah, just that's, wanted to make that clear. Yeah, yeah I, I think that's great to yeah. note because, you know, when, when we talk about CMRA initially, yeah. we talk about only collecting for Canada. Yeah. Our international collection services launched in March, and that's now for, to work with you guys in, in the US, specifically the MLC and then to work with external territories with MPEL. Um, so yeah, we, we work very similarly <laughs> to you and focus on territories. And I think rights, rights and royalties work that way around the world. Um, Great, thank you. There's a question you. here, does SOCAN collect mechanicals via CMRA? No. <laughs> SOCAN um, has um, a service called SOCAN RR. Um, they do uh, work with a small market in Canada of for mechanical rights, um, and you can investigate that as well. But they don't work with us to collect for them. <laughs> yes, two separate okay. options. Two yeah. options, people. And um, they are a member of the MLC. Yes, thank yes. you. I was just going to ask <laughs> you to explain that yeah. because that's the other side that I know that people sure. are wondering about yeah. um, is the performance performance side. Sorry, no, the mechanical. PR, the, mechanical, sorry, yeah. yes. Yeah. I'm getting confused. Um, we have a question here. This is a MLC question. Um, so they have a client who is a member of PRS and PPL in the UK. Do they have options with the MLC to sign up? If, if it's PRS, that's the performing rights side of things and PPL is a recording side of things. So um, actually, if they have a relationship or an agreement with MCPS, which is, so PRS is the Performing Rights Society in the UK. There's also the Mechanical Rights Society in the UK called MCPS. Um, if they've mandated the MCPS or they're a member of MCPS and they've, um, MCPS is, a, has, um, they've given MCPS the mandate to collect outside of the UK, and uh, obviously the US, then yes, that, um, the MCPS would collect on their behalf. So the songwriter doesn't need to then become a member. Um, if they're not a member of MCPS, Mechanical Rights Organization, then they can, as a songwriter, become a member of the MLC directly if they wish to. Got it. A lot of opting in. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I have a very sort of basic beginner question. I just want to make sure that I have a personally, and maybe other people, this question may help them also, but the distinction of interactive streaming, can you clarify what's meant by interactive streaming? Is that just like anything, any stream on I'll, I'll jump in on there. Thank um, you. So, <laughs> sure. 
So there's two types of streaming. There's interactive streaming and non-interactive streaming. So interactive streaming is basically um, your ability to choose the track um, that you want to listen to, such as a Spotify. Um, a non-interactive -interac stream is more of a laid-back radio style um, experience where you might be able to choose a station or a station theme, but you don't actually select the tracks that you're going to listen to in any given sequence. Um, so think of a, a Pandora radio, uh, for example. Um, so you know, interactive is your ability to pause, skip, uh, go backwards, replay, uh, basically interact with the track. Um, and non-interactive means you you might be able to skip a track or two, but you can't uh, rewind or pause it um, or select the actual track you're listening to. Um, so we're only dealing with interactive streaming. Uh, we're not dealing with non-interactive streaming. Uh, we're also dealing with uh, digital downloads, uh, but we're not dealing with physical uh, goods. Perfect, thank you. Um, could you, Day, could you explain a little bit more about the Harry Fox Agency and who, they, who they are, like, I don't know, Rebecca, is that a thing in Canada? Like, is this, <laughs> I don't know if that's Well, the Harry Fox Agency, uh, uh, the Harry Fox Agency is a, um, is a company um, that provides services to publishers and um, digital, uh, well, but any type of music user, um, whether it's an app, a startup app or a streaming service or, um, you know, a, a, a social media app that wants to license music for the background of videos. Um, so Harry Fox Agency is a uh, sort of a music licensing and music clearance service um, that powers um, um, uh, administration on behalf of, of um, music users, but also represents uh, reproduction rights on behalf of their publisher affili affiliates. Um, we work with HFA uh, as a vendor. Um, they've been around for many years um, dealing with uh, mechanical licensing on behalf of their publisher members. Um, so they've accrued um, um, a database of ownership information uh, regarding the works that they've licensed. Um, and we've you know, started our database um, uh, with Harry Fox uh, data, but we've since have grown um, significantly with new work registrations from CMOs and uh, rights holders directly. Uh, we will, we're continuing to work with um, Harry Fox to support some of our um, um, operational needs, um, but um, we are two different organizations. They are a for-profit organization. We're a non-profit organization. Uh, we are a government-mandated organization. They are um, a voluntary um, a, a existing company um, that publishers can choose to work with for many reasons beyond the uh, MLC. Um, they do much more... Um, they do other type of work uh, than the MLC. We're, we're simply uh, administering um, uh, Title I of the Music Modernization Act, whereas the Harry Fox Agency um, is providing a number of services for publishers um, and digital media companies. Uh, so they are a standalone uh, company providing different types of administration and rights and licensing um, um, services. Um, just to jump in here, we, we get the question about Harry Fox a lot um, because people often say what, you know, what is the equivalent in the U.S. to CMRA? And, um, you know, the closest up until the MLC was created was Harry Fox, but it wasn't the same thing exactly. And they didn't work with as many stakeholders. That is to say, they didn't work with, you know, smaller songwriters. Um, so smaller songwriters, uh, you know, maybe had to find other options in sub-publishing or using a company like SongTrust to try and make sure that they're collecting from the U.S. So, um, you know, we would always say it's sort of Harry Fox, but it's not quite. Um, just, but just to give that perspective of, um, you know, equivalence between countries. <laughs> Yeah, that's great. Well, I would just add that, um, yeah, in the United States, we do, we, we have not had, and we still do not have a, uh, a full scale CMO um, in regards to mechanical rights, reproduction yeah. rights. Um, there is no equivalent to CMRRA in the United States. Um, we have sort of piecemeal <laughs> CMRRA um, across organizations like Harry Fox and Music Reports, uh, which are for profit, you know, independent, independent companies. Um, and then um, the MLC, which is a sort of quasi-government organization um, mandated for a particular right for a particular set of, of, of um, uh, services, but we do not have a, a CMRA, CMRA equivalent in the United States. And the other thing is, um, you know, legally, the, the rights between, in Canada and, and the U.S. are quite 
different in some cases. Um, in Canada, we can collect for rate broadcast radio, for example. Um, and so that would, there are some gaps in the US and that's why it's a bit piecemeal, um, but it's getting better with the, you know, MMA creating the MLC. Um, so, you know, I think there's gonna be more reliable royalty collection from now on. And hopefully if the lobbyists win in the US, um, you know, broadcast mechanicals might be next in the US. So we're lucky in Canada, I think. Definitely, lots of lots of uh, busy advocates pushing for reforms here with regards to this stuff. Um, there's a question from Eric asking, is music reports associated with the MLC? Jay or Indy, do you know? Um, music reports is not associated with MLC in the sense that they are a member. Um, we, uh, HFA uh, is our vendor. Um, however, music reports, um, just like any other a company um, is able to interact with the MLC on behalf of, of, of their members or their uh, clients if it's uh, appropriate. Um, we have a number of uh, partnership initiatives at the MLC around our data, for example, our uh, bulk data um, feed, uh, which Music Reports and other companies can um, access our database to use that in their services and in, 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 in ways that make sense for their business. Um, we also have our, our data quality initiative um, again, where you know, third-party software companies and service providers can um, facilitate uh, participating in our data, data quality initiative on behalf of rights holders and administrators. Um, and we will have other um, types of, of, of features and services roll out in the, in the future where companies like um, Music Reports can participate on behalf of publisher members um, or potentially on behalf of, of, of DSP members. Um, it really depends on um, you know, their business, but they are not um, a direct partner of the MLC um, nor a vendor of the MLC um, like um, HFA. Great, thank you. Um, I wanted to just get a little bit more detail if you can regarding the blanket license to DSPs. So if, if you can talk us through what what that kind of looks like. And what my question in particular would be like, I know so many people are registered to be distribute like their digital distributor, let's say it's DistroKid. Um, so what happens in those cases? So again, talking about people that are really doing everything by themselves with no label support and no publisher. Well, I'll tackle this one. It seems like there are two questions there. Okay. One in regards to the um, well, Andy, if you want to tackle the, the, the regards to the actual um, blanket license, and I'll talk about the supplementary sure. songwriters dealing with uh, uh, aggregators. Yeah, so the blanket license itself. So what um, previously um, the system was that uh, the digital services had to basically send a, a notice of intent or contact to the copyright owners to get a license for those works on their platform. Now, more often than not, they didn't know who the copyright owners were because there wasn't like a global database where they could access that information. They got the information probably from the aggregators, from the labels, but that information was really concerning the sound recording information. So not necessarily who actually wrote that song information. So that's where that came about. And actually sort of acquiring individual licenses is um, when you've got that many works, it may be, Maybe fine if it was a CD and maybe 15 songs, you know, that's not so bad and the volume isn't so great and obviously catalogs change hands. So the whole process was quite inefficient. So what the blanket license is, it, it basically allows the digital services, instead of contacting all the copyright owners, they now need to send a notice of license to the MLC to say, you know, we now wish to the MLC to administer a blanket license for all those works that are on our platform. And that means that they don't have to contact all the copyright owners um, to do that. Now, they then send this instruction or a notice to say, yes, we want the MLC to administer this blanket license. Um, so, by, so once they do that, they then need to send their usage reports to us. So to report that usage reports to us, we will then match the sound recordings to the musical works. And that's why we need the members to register their data with us to make sure we have that accurate copyright information in our database. And then we will calculate the royalties owed and then pay the MLC members. 
um, with the monies that the DSPs have to send to the MLC. So that's just a sort of basic overview of that blanket license process. Great, Great. thank you. Um, and then the other portion of the was oh. in regards to South Dementia songwriters working with independent aggregators like DistroKid. <clears throat> um, well, if you're a you know, singer songwriter who you know, owns your own masters, own your publishing, and you're distributing your music to DSPs via uh, aggregators such as DistroKid, um, you are, um, you know, you're putting your music in the um, sort of the licensing sphere where it's going to earn royalties of different kinds, and then those royalties are going to trickle down through um, the different um, um, sort of pipelines of services. So for the mechanical side, um, which is for the reproduction of your um, digital audio files, um, those royalties will flow through uh, the, the MLC um, for DSPs that are operating under our blanket license. Um, so for the performance royalty share that will flow through um, a PRO, Performing Rights Organization, um, or a CMO that has performing rights. Um, and then for the master side royalties that comes back through your distributor, so that flow through DistroKit. Um, so there's three different um, income streams that are being earned um, on those uh, releases um, every time that they are uh, streamed in a, a, a digital service provider such as Spotify or Apple Music. Um, so it's important to um, have a relationship uh, with the organizations um, either directly or through an administrator or through your CMO um, who's responsible for collecting um, those three different income, well, two of those income streams, uh, which are performing rights and um, uh, reproduction rights. Um, the master side income flows through DistroKit. Uh, so if you're using DistroKit, for example, that's where your master side income will flow through, um, but your publishing side income uh, which are performing rights, uh, performing royalties and mechanical royalties will not flow through um, the aggregator district kit. It will flow instead um, through um, the organizations, uh, again, MLC in the United States. Um, you know, same thing in, in Canada flows through the CMRRA. Um, but um, if you are using a service such as CD Baby Pro, which offers a publishing administration service, um, then if you sign up for the publishing administration service, uh, then that publishing administrator will be collecting um, those royalties. Um, and there's also um, services, um, uh, software companies that enable you as a self-administered songwriter um, to organize uh, your data and register your works um, uh, as well. So there's, there's, there's another option um, uh, to do that. And we have some partnerships um, with some of those companies such as Tune Registry and um, that enables you to uh, register your works and, and manage your, your copyrights. So there's a lot of options to choose from. It's really about um, knowing you know, what you prefer to do based on your business. I saw a, a comment earlier in the chat that someone said they would rather sign up with CMRA as opposed to going to 150 locations to register your works and it's, it can become a process. So it really depends on what your business um, needs are. Um, if you um, uh, find that, um, um, you know, doing it yourself makes sense, or if, you know, partnering or becoming a member of an organization that handles all the stuff for you so you can just focus on your music. It really depends on your individual needs. That's great. Thank you so much. Rebecca, I'm going to throw this question to you. I know um, this last one here is um, asking from the perspective of a self-published Canadian songwriter, uh, you know, whose songs play in both Canada and the U.S., so can we get the pros and cons of joining MLC versus CMRA? Um, but I think the, the answer is you can do both. Uh, well, you could, you, you wanna do one or the other, um, first of all. Um, and I think, so I'm just gonna give an example. We, we had a client of ours who, um, you know, they're, they're medium-sized music publishers. So they represent a bunch of songwriters and they, they went, into the back end of the MLC and they looked at some data there and they thought we need to clean up a lot of these songs that none of the administration is, is, um, is, is correct or accurate right now. So we don't have enough staff to deal with this. And I think we're gonna you know, let CMRA handle that administration. Um, that would be you know, something to consider when you're trying to make a decision on you know, it's time or money, right? You, you, yes, we have an administration of 5%. It's our lowest administration fee of all of our business lines, but we'll be doing the verification 
of the songs and making sure everything is registered. Um, note that when you get a statement from us, we do share by share accounting. So you will know what service it was played on um, and you know, for the percentage that you own of that song and, and you'll get that accounting both retroactively once these um, unidentified um, amounts start flowing through, which, which will be later on in the year and for the go forward stuff. So, um, you know, I, I think it's that it could be a pro or a con for you really, um, but it applies for songwriters as well as music publishers. I think, um, you know, how much time do you have? What do you want to spend your time on? <laughs> um, but, you know, the worst thing you can do is not sign up anywhere. Agreed. Well, that takes us almost to 2 p.m. Uh, I think that we've addressed most of the questions. If there's any last questions, people feel, feel free to throw them in. Give it a sec. And um, as always, we will um, we'll be sending out some resources from today uh, with a link to this recording if you feel that you need to rewatch any part of it. Um, as Taylor, thank you so much, Taylor, for monitoring the chat and uh, sharing all those awesome resources in the in the in there. Um, I have oh one final question from Eric: uh, Can independent U.S. composers join CMRA and foreign? Um, composers? We work with anyone who um, whose songs are streamed, played, or downloaded in Canada for the right. territory of Canada. So um, if you own part of a song all of a song and it's being played here, then yes. If That's actually, I would actually want to um, mention something like that. That's a good, really good point. Um, I want to also drill in and say that the MLC, we do not collect uh, mechanical royalties outside of the United States, um, nor do we pay mechanical royalties for um, usage outside the United States. Um, so um, if you are in this webinar and you happen to be a US songwriter, um, uh, as, as I mentioned before, uh, the United States does not have an equivalent of the CMRRA, meaning we do not have a uh, quasi-government or government organization collecting mechanical royalties outside the United States. Um, so you would still need a partner such as CMRRA to collect royalties in Canada, uh, so from the other way around, um, yeah. or a, or a sub-publisher uh, who's working with CMRRA um, or an administrator who's working with CMRRA, but it would not be, um, as a member of the MLC, you would not be collecting uh, mechanical royalties earned in Canada uh, through the MLC because we do not uh, uh, collect outside the United States. Yeah. Um, thank you for that plug. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> um, but also, um, we, um, we, we're going to clarify this in some announcements soon. Um, but, you know, when we were talking with Impel in the UK, Impel clients are now going to be able to collect from the MLC through us as well. Um, so it's going to be a trilateral agreement. So they can collect in Canada from us, but also now into the U.S. because we're facilitating that administration too. So, um, you know, we're really trying to make it possible for a lot of different groups. Um, and <laughs> I'm looking at the chat here. People are overwhelmed. <laughs> that's, that's okay. That's what the recording and follow-up stuff is for. Sometimes we all need a little bit of extra time. <laughs> Can I also mention that the Please. MLC website is really, really useful and being updated all the time. You know, it, it's a very new organization at CMRA. We're learning. We have weekly meetings um, every week, um, just finding out all the nuances, how it's working, how things are flowing. Um, I know there was someone who, who wanted an update, who was a client of CMRA already, who asked earlier, um, you know, where are we at right now? We haven't, even though the MLC has paid out a, a payment, um, I think it was in April for January, um, go forward royalties. Um, we haven't paid our clients for the MLC to, yet because we um, are still registering works and we expect to have our first payment either in the September or dis December distributions, um, but we wanna make sure everything is done correctly. It's, it's still a really new system, so. Um, hopefully that's helpful. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much. Uh, again, Indy, Rebecca, and Day, thank you so much for taking the time today to be here and to explain 
this to everybody and to share all of that information and answer all of our questions. Very, very helpful. And thank you everybody for being here today. And I hope to see some of you this evening again, if you wanted to come to this um, social event, I'm posting it in one more time. We can't stop myself. And um, yeah, have a wonderful week. And if there's any further questions, you know, please shoot me a note and I will do what I can to uh, find that info for you. So thank, thank you everyone. You. Thanks everyone. Thank you.